I'll wait till you press record. But I did. Recording has started. We are recording. All right, thank you. At this time, I'd like to call the um, meeting of the Plan Village Plan Commission to order at 6.31 p.m. We have four commissioners or and the chair present with um, Commissioner Klein and Commissioner Kudo excused this evening. Um, I'm going to thank everyone for their time, talent, and patient in advance as we conduct the business of the village. We also are transitioning technology platforms from Zoom to Microsoft Teams. So if we have any technological challenges, we may have to take a quick recess or, or something, but your patience will be appreciated. I believe there's an announcement. Would you like to make that? Uh, kind of um, hailing on that as well. So if there's any virtual participants that for some reason, if we're not slides aren't advancing or you can't hear us, feel free to raise your hand. That way I'll know that we should pause to fix that issue. Um, and then my quick announcement is attorney Bayer will be joining us. Um, I did not invite him um, as I usually do. And I caught him this afternoon late. So he uh, had some other things to, to get to, but he will be joining us soon as soon as he can. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much. Um, are there any items in particular that you think we should hold until he's here or? I don't believe so, but okay. in case you guys have any, I just referencing that he will be showing up. So if we need to defer, move things around, we can, um, but oh. he should be here within right. reasonable time. Okay, uh, moving on to item two, approval of December 6th, minute, December 6th 2022 meeting minutes. Um, is there a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of the December 6th meeting. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, motion by um, Barbara Kylie Miller, seconded by Kate Flynn Post. Um, any discussion? I just want to say great job. It was a very technical meeting and the minutes were very easy to follow. All right, hearing no discussion, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? And any abstentions? All right, motion carries and the minutes are adopted as presented. Item three, consideration of conditional use permit application for the operation of a resale and consignment business at commercial property 2518 East Capitol Drive. Um, we will take this in the order that it's agended with an overview um, followed by public comment, followed by plan commission deliberation. Um, the um, items, uh, this item is presented to us um, in our um, online materials um, with a complete memo and a copy of the um, materials submitted for consider application. Um, are there any questions, technical questions at this time for Director Griepenjog? I do have a brief overview of this. Oh, then please you're proceed. Acceptable. Um, and this will test if we can share the slides. I misunderstood your previous comment. <laughs> no, that's acceptable. Um, and this will help us test the slides for the remainder of the meeting as well. So hopefully those in the audience can um, see that we are at the Plan Commission meeting. The first item that we are here to discuss is a resale for a condition, or a condition use permit for a resale business at 2518 East Capitol Drive. Complete information is in the memo in the packet, um, but as a matter of reference, a resale conditional use permit was recently approved for this building. It chose not to move forward, um, and so a second applicant has um, brought this for us. The new applicant is known as Posh, Posh, Posh Fashion and Consignment Boutique. They'll be located at 2518 East Capitol Drive. Um, the parcel is zone B3 mixed use commercial district in which resale shops are listed as conditional use. No interior exterior modifications are associated with this specific um, application, although the building itself is going undergoing some interior modifications to split itself from one tenant space into three. Um, the proposed operation is a resale of men's and women's clothing and accessories, um, which will also require a secondhand article dealer license to be issued by the village board. The tenant space is 815 square feet. Proposed operations are 10 a.m. through 9 p.m. up to seven days a week, and one to two employees would be on site. Um, parking is not applicable to this application since it does not involve uh, new development, substantial enlargement, or a change in use. Um, as indicated in the packet, the Plan Commission shall review the site, existing, condition, existing structures, neighboring uses, traffic generation and circulation, and proposed operations um, and shall find that the seven conditions listed in 53525C um, are applicable or are acceptable. So that's my brief introduction. 
and the applicant is here as well if there's any questions for myself or for them. Any technical questions for Director Griepentrog or the applicant? Yes, Commissioner. I have a couple of questions for the applicant. Mm -hmm. um, Could you come up to the microphone, um, Cynthia? And just to warn you, that microphone, you have to talk really close to it in order to be heard. <laughs> it's for the recording for the people on. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, Hi. thanks for being here tonight. Um, I noticed in the application that you had operated a similar business yes. in the past in Wauwatosa. And so I'm just wondering, is this a second location for that business or just a new operation? No, a new op. It is. Yes. Um, and I'm just wondering, are you, is your business or the ownership group related to the other resale, women's resale shop that we have on Capitol Drive also posh? Collective or oh. two separate companies? Okay. Just separate. So you're not acquainted professionally no. or anything. Okay. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Hearing no further questions, I'd like to move to 4B public comment. At this time, we'll take um, public comment. And please, um, if you would like to speak on the matter, um, please approach the microphone and be prepared to share your name and address um, and then uh, folks that are joining us virtually um, please raise your hand um, and we will move through and if you can keep your comments to um, three minutes that is greatly appreciated we will keep a loose time on that is there anyone who would like to be heard on this matter All right, I'm not seeing anyone in person and I'm not seeing any hands raised. But this time I will close public comment. Um, I didn't notice the time that I started, but it couldn't have been. It was like 637 to 638 or something yep. like that. Um, OK, moving on to 4C, I mean 3C, um, Plan Commission Deliberation. So the motion before us, the recommended motion is to approve. Um, so I would uh, take a motion to approve or comments at this time. Commissioner Wickland. I'll make a motion. Okay. Uh, I move to approve the conditional use permit application, the operation of a resale and consignment business at commercial property, 2518 East Capitol Drive, based on meeting the conditions stipulated in 535-25C. Is there a second? Yes. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Wickland, second by Commissioner Kate Flynn, um, Flynn Post. Um, all, any discussion? Commissioner Kylie Miller. I have a little concern that we have a similar business operating on Capitol Drive in the village with a similar name. So my concern has to do with confusion, whether for customers mm -hmm. or Promotions, maybe whether that either business or the business improvement district is doing deliveries. Um, I guess I feel the same way for any established small business in our village. Say, for example, the Olson House Charming Shop that sells Scandinavian home design and decor things. Another business wanted to open up on Oakland Avenue with the Olson Home or the Olson Room. You know, something that could, a name that could create confusion. Mm -hmm. That's my concern. I don't ever want to take an action that might damage, take away business from either a new or existing business in the village. I mean, I'm happy to consider this use in that space on the condition perhaps the name be changed. But as it is, but, I, I have a con some concern yeah. about problems that could arise. Um, at this point, I'm going to ask, it, it, my interpretation is that falls outside of the scope of this body okay. um, because we are re reviewing a conditional use and right. you're talking about a business plan and a name. Right. So you can vote no however you want, <laughs> um, but I, I, it's hard for me to believe that that's within scope. Director Griebentrug? So I, just, I reshared the screen of the um, seven conditions. I, I don't believe that matches any of them, but if Commissioner Kelly Miller wanted to point to one of those more specifically, I think that would make um, good reference in the, in the minutes, at least, if, if there was a connection to one of those. Um, I also agree 
that I don't believe that is within the scope, but I will um, let Commissioner Kylie Miller, you know, comment or respond to that. Uh, one thing I do know in general is that in terms of like signage review, we can't freedom of speech. We can't tell someone to put in their sign. Um, so you could have a McDonald's and, you know, wh whatever. That's always the reference the design review board always uses. So um, I completely understand that I don't want things confusing either, but I'm just not sure that I agree that it can be yeah, a condition. It's, yeah. it's not the role of this body. So point taken and we'll record it in the min minutes. Other uh, deliberation? I'd just like to make a comment that I think it would be great to have a business in favor. I don't see any reason to. And according to the seven criteria. A value with which to re value. Um, yep, so hearing no further discussion at this point, I would like to take a vote. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Okay, so um, motion carries with five, no, four yeses and one no. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, item, oh, so thank you very much and welcome to the village. And I can't wait for you to open. Best of luck. Thank you for being here this evening. Item four, consideration of condi conditional use permit application to construct a chimney that will exceed the maximum building height on a new single unit dwelling at residential property 3534 North Lake Drive. Uh, we will again um, proceed with an overview from staff, um, public comment, and then conclude with plan commission deliberation. So for a overview, um, all the materials are in the our um, our packet as well. Correct. Thank you, President McKagan. Just a reminder for everyone to speak into the microphones. I received the text that um, not all of our last conversation was as clear as it could be. So just move it close and speak clearly. Um, so what is before us um, this evening is a conditional use permit for an application for a chimney that exceeds the height um, at the proposed um, new construction at 3534 North Lake Drive. Similar to the last application in 2019, we also did review and approve um, a conditional use permit for an for a chimney above the height as well, but this is a completely different project and a new review is required. Um, project parcel overview, this is a new single unit residential dwelling. Um, 3534 North Lake Drive is zoned R1, Lake Drive Residence District number one. The maximum building height of that district is 30 feet. Um, of note, the uh, measurement for that is the mean elevation of the roof. So the actual the ridge roof is above, um, above that maximum, but the um, how we measure it, it does conform with a 30 feet. However, the chimney does exceed that 30 foot uh, maximum. So a conditional use permit is required for 53530A. This is just a general overview of the elevation here. So you'll see the proposed maximum height of the chimney is 36 feet, six and three eighths inches. Um, that ridge, like I mentioned, is 32 feet, but that's acceptable because we actually measure it from the mean elevation of the pitched roof, which is 28 feet and a half so the the roof once again conforms the chimney is what requires review here tonight the architectural plans for the home were approved by the design review board on december 1st 2022 um, as i mentioned the chimney does exceed the ridge roof by four feet of note building code requires that the chimney to extend at least three feet above the highest point where it passes through the roof and be at least two feet higher than any portion of the house with within 10 feet of the chimney so that's provided for reference in terms of what is required to issue permits for um, such construction um, for reference, and this was provided at the last review as well, the chimney um, to the north of this property at 3550 North Lake Drive is 30 feet, 34 feet in height. The chimney on the garage of the property to the south, 3510 North Lake Drive is 36 feet in height. Um, and the chimney on the house of that property is 49 feet actually. Um, and so there are neighboring properties that have exceeded this as well. Um, I don't know the history of when this 30 foot um, chimney was in place, but there are many homes on Lake Drive, including the two neighbors that do currently exceed it. Um, we did receive opposition from the um, property owners at 3562, which was provided to um, the plan commission for their reference. Um, once again, the plan commission shall review site, existing and proposed structures, architectural plans, neighboring uses and proposed operations in their review of 53525C uh, prior to making its findings. Once again, the applicant is here to answer any questions that might arise. All right, thank you very much. So with that, I would like to know if there are any technical questions um, or questions for the applicant. Yes, Commissioner 
Commissioner Flynn Post. And I believe um, it is hard to hear you, so you, you got to drag it closer. Question just in reviewing the criteria that we're um, that we need to to look at. Um, is, is there any concern about safety? There is not from a building perspective. Um, the, the property, once again, is set back considerably inside of that lot line as well. Um, I don't have it offhand, but the applicant might know it. So I, I actually believe it's around 60 feet. And I'm sorry, could you speak in the microphone? Okay. Yep. <laughs> and if you can say your name and your address. And try to talk loud enough so you can like really hear yourself. Hi, this is Katie Min with Works Architect. A little louder, sorry. <laughs> Regarding 3534 North Lake. Um, so the the distance of the setback from the closest part of the guest wing, which is inboard, if we go back to the, of the chimney, is 28 feet. That's our proposed setback. So you can see to the closest edge of there is 28 feet. To the building chimney itself would be probably about. Ask the question about safety just because that's you know something that we're tasked with reviewing and not being an expert on chimney safety. <laughs> I want to know more about that. Um, so um, trying to see if I have any other questions. I, I think uh, that I'm good at this time. Thanks. Yes, Commissioner Wicklin. Yeah, Bart, so again, the, the IRC requirements for this, it's two feet, 10 feet away. Correct. Not four, two, right? Um, two feet higher than any portion of the house within ten feet of the chimney. Got it. And that's the same. I mean, it ha so it has to be above the. I mean, it's it's thirty six, but it has to be above the thirty because to meet the IRC requirements, you can't have a chimney, and that is a safety issue, right? So it draws properly and things like that. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? If not, I believe the. The motion in our packet is to approve because it there are no conflicting criteria. Um, so I would entertain a motion to approve at this time. Commissioner Wicklin. Yep, I will. Uh, I move to approve the conditional use permit application to construct a chimney that exceeds the maximum building height on the new single dwelling single unit dwelling at residential property 3534 North Lake Drive. Per the plans attached to this application based on meeting the conditions stipulated in 535-25C. Yes. Just want to confirm whether or not we had public comment. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, in case I, there was anyone out there. Apologies. Can I I'll withdraw that my motion for now. Excellent. Well, it wasn't seconded in any way. So, yes, at this time, I'd like to open public comment at um, 4B um, at 648. So anyone that is in, present who would like to speak on this matter can come to the microphone. Anyone who is joining us virtually can raise their hand. All right, as you can see, no one is approaching the microphone in person and there are no hands raised um, on the virtual platform. So with that, I will close public comment at 649. And now I will move on to plan commission <laughs> deliberation 4C. Um, if you would like to make a motion at this time, um, I would entertain that. I would still like to make a motion now. Mm -hmm. Uh, I move to approve the conditional use permit application to construct a chimney that exceeds the maximum building height on a new single unit dwelling at residential property 3534 North Lake Drive. Per the plans attached to this application based on meeting the conditions stipulated in 535-25C. I'll second that motion. Okay, motion by Commissioner Wicklin, seconded by Commissioner Kylie Miller. Is there any um, comment or discussion at this time from the plan commission? All right, hearing none, I'd like to take a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Moving on, so thank you very much for being here this evening and good luck with the project. Moving on to item five, discussion and consideration of resolution 2023-07, a resolution recommending the adoption amendment number one to the Village of Shorewood Comprehensive Plan 2040 in relation to the commercial zoning update. 
So as you'll recall, this is an item that we um, discussed and recommended uh, previously. It's in relation to the commercial zoning update because there are a few minor um, changes. Um, are there any other comments that you would like to make, Director Griepenschrag, as to how this can um, relates to previous action that we've taken? Yep, nope, the information in your packet uh, matches what you just said. So we are here to entertain a recommendation via resolution so that the village board can consider adoption of said amendment at their February 6th meeting prior to and in conjunction with deliberating the commercial zoning update as well. So um, once again, the information is the same as it was last month. We're looking here um, to strike the sentence in, in, the three sent in the three sections of the land use element that say ground floor non-residential development is required in this area. Um, that will that will match the recommendation, which is a more nuanced approach to um, uh, zoning in the district. And so, once again, same information that was um, recommended um, or provided direction on in the December meeting. We're just here to consider it via resolution, which I do believe requires a roll call. That's the only right. nuance here that I can think of. Are there any commissioners that need clarification on this matter? Okay, seeing none, I would entertain a motion at this time. I gotta get back. Um, I move to approve a resolution uh, 2023-07, a resolution recommending the adoption of Amendment 1 to the Village of Shorewood Comprehensive Plan 2040 in relation to the commercial zoning up. Second. All right, motion by Commissioner Pollock, uh, Pollock um, seconded by Commissioner Wicklund. Um, any discussion at this time? All right, hearing none, this will be a roll call vote. Yes. Yes. Robert Riley Miller. Yes. Kate Flynn Post. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Um, moving on to item six, discussion and recommendation of ordinance amendment implementing the village's commercial zoning update by repealing and replacing chapter 535 zoning and associated changes in section 225-12 design review board chapter 319 article 1 food service subsection 326-7 minimum space use and location requirements, chapter 437, article two, display of merchandise in outdoor areas, and subsection 455-2, refuse and collection service. So as you'll recall, um, at our previous meeting, we reviewed um, the final draft, um, and in our minutes, it documented all of the um, discussion, um, consensus and also direction that was provided to the consultant um, by the plan commission. Um, and now we are being presented with a public hearing draft, correct? Correct. Um, with those anticipated changes, they've um, all materials are provided within the um, packet. Um, Director Griepenjog, did you um, receive any questions of clarification to, of clarification or comments that are we're not aware of? I have not. Okay. Um, so at this time, I would like to, is there, did you want to do a presentation or we have? A... Yes, Leslie Overholzer from Coda Metrics has prepared a brief presentation, just kind of summarizing where we are at this moment and then just kind of reminding you what, what direction was provided that is seen in these changes um, to date. So Leslie, I will, um, Share my screen, but you'll have to direct me one to move forward, okay? Okay, thanks. If, if that's okay, President McKay? Yes, thank you. Bart, you can it. hit Command L and it'll go full screen, make it a little bigger. I don't know if you wanna do that. No, okay. No, that's not. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. Here we you. go. <laughs> can you hear me? We can yes, hear you. I, okay, I'm going to move you up to the corner, first of all. Let's start there. If this is the only technical problems we have, I'll be very happy. And then um, Control L? No. Command I'm, L? I'm not, I'm not working from a Mac, remember, so. 
Yeah, it's Command L or something like that. Go to View, and um, it just will make everything a little bit bigger. Um, full screen mode, Control L. Control L. There we go. Okay. <laughs> There Great. We well, um, I will go really quickly um, through these sort of upfront slides. Um, you all know about the working group. Um, we talked about that last time. Um, next slide. Um, this is just to say, and you've already uh, uh, recommended the revisions, the minor revisions, but to say that uh, we really are supporting the comprehensive plan moving forward. It provides the basis for all these new zoning. Um, next slide. And there was a very clear project scope um, that was written. This is pulled directly from the uh, request for proposals that I responded to. Um, and hopefully we are meeting these goals um, from the project, project scope. And the next slide. Um, just to clarify or to repeat um, that we are addressing all of the B2 zoning um, there's a, a little bit of uh, um, expansion of that that we'll get into in just a second, but essentially we're, uh, this is new zoning for all of the commercial corridors uh, within the village. Next slide. And this is where we are. Um, we have been through a, uh, a really uh, robust uh, system of review with the working group. Um, we met multiple times, as you can see in the uh, bottom left-hand corner, the dates. And this is the beginning of the adoption process. Next slide. Um, so what I've got here is uh, seven or eight slides really quickly of the revisions that have been made since uh, the presentation of the draft in December. Um, the first revision that we made was uh, to revise the zoning for the police station on Wilson Drive. Um, we decided to remove it from the GX2 zone, even though um, the use is allowed in that zone, um, but it would just be more consistent with all of the other uh, village owned um, parcels and, and uh, civic uh, uses. Um, and so we will show you these, uh, the rezoning of that to P1 that we are proposing. So just removing the GX2 zone um, from the police station. Next slide. Um, and then, as you recall, uh, we've revised the, uh, the planned development district to become a legacy overlay. And because of that, we needed to uh, provide base zoning on all of the um, parcels where the PDD was previously applied. And the PDDs carry over um, as, as an overlay. Um, but we just needed uh, some sort of base zoning to apply to them. And so this map shows you uh, not only the new zoning for P1 for the police station, but also the base zoning for the parcels outside of the commercial districts um, around the village that currently have PDs uh, applied to them. And what, what uh, we've done here is apply the closest existing R district or P district, obviously, for um, the village hall and the library um, that we thought made the most sense. So this would be another part of the rezoning uh, moving forward. Um, in discussions with the uh, property owner of uh, the major G3, GX3 district, um, they're at the intersection of Oakland and Capitol that you can see from the, um, the map in the middle. Uh, we made a few revisions just based on the uh, existing buildings there and some of the proposals that we had seen. Um, so just in the bottom left hand corner, one of the revisions was um, to revise the uh, minimum setback for the rear portion of the property. Um, if it is within, uh, if it had an alley serving the property then the minimum rear setback could be five feet. The way that it was written before was it required that 20 feet if there was no alley um, at all anywhere. Um, and so we're just allowing for those kind of side accessed alleys. As you can see, um, the parcel kind of in the middle there, yeah, thanks, is served by an alley to the side um, as opposed to the rear. 
So we've revised all of the GX actually to allow for that side alley to be um, to be utilized um, and then a minimum five foot rear setback if there is a side alley. There really are very few locations where this applies. This is the main one. The second revision um, was they requested additional height on that ground floor um, to create a kind of grand lobby. Um, and I believe that the office building on the corner also has a large ground floor, um, a higher ground floor than normal. So we increased the ground floor for just GX3 to 16 feet max. Um, and then the third revision was, and we discussed this at our last meeting, um, at eight and a half stories, whether or not a step back is needed on that top story. Um, and we removed that requirement um, for that step back on the eight and a half story buildings. Um, so anything in the GX3 would not be required to have that step back on the street facades. Okay, next slide. Um, in terms of bird friendly design, we had a lot of discussion about this. Um, and I just want to go over the revisions that were made um, based on our conversations. So the first one is that um, instead of applying to buildings that are 10,000 square feet or greater, uh, we revised it to be 5,000 square feet or greater. Um, so this means that the bird friendly design uh, regulations would apply to more buildings um, within the village. Um, the second revision that was made was to uh, require uh, the new surfacing uh, for bird friendly design, if more than 50% uh, 50 or more of the applicable windows uh, were replaced. Um, so that was uh, voted on, I think, uh, during our last meeting and applied to the regulations. The third revision that we made um, during that December meeting was to increase the fly through condition uh, separate panels of glass to 30 feet, um, anything within 30 feet as opposed to 15. You froze on us, Leslie. I'm not sure if it's on your end or our end. Let me stop the share and see if that does anything. Is anyone on the line experiencing a freeze? Like, are we frozen? Oh, okay. Could anyone on the line raise their hand if they can hear us still? Okay. Oh, Leslie can hear us. So, Leslie, um, you're frozen on our end. We can't hear you and your video is frozen. I don't know. Maybe try going off camera, Leslie. Maybe rejoin the meeting. I say, could you maybe leave and come back in? Um, if you can. Got kicked out. Maybe that yellow shows up really nicely on the <laughs> screen. <laughs> yeah, she said she got kicked out. I have to let her back in. Um, but there's no. There's no presenter or there's no um, admittance. Anyone can just join this meeting. It's a public meeting. So she should be able to. Oh, I have to. Here we go. I have to allow her. Allow Mike. Allow camera. And now I believe. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You are. We got okay. two of you, but one of you moves this time, so that's great. So I'll reshare the slides. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. So what did you hear last? Um, you just you you finished up with the fly through conditions being modified to thirty feet, I believe, is where we ended off. Oh, okay, yeah, that was it. Okay, and so just because the window replacement 
um, was added, uh, we did have to create a trigger for design review um, based on that window place replacement. Uh, next slide. Um, so this was uh, this was a discussion sort of based on the GX3, but we thought that it was also a good idea. Um, we created a planning adjustment uh, for those uh, limited uh, uses. So if you recall in the GX zones, uh, eating and drinking places and um, artisan manufacturing and retail sales are all three limited to no more than 25% of the ground floor. Uh, we created a planning adjustment that could be approved by the plan commission for an additional 10% of the footprint so that it would be a maximum of 35%, which would be you know, about a third uh, of the footprint. Um, also, um, we added a new uh, use category called indoor entertainment. Um, some of these uses were would have been allowed um, within consumer service, but we thought it best to um, pull those out and create a general kind of entertain, indoor entertainment uses, which would include things like bowling alleys, um, which you could get a very small bowling alley, um, arcades, and um, things like laser tag um, or escape rooms. So those would be allowed uh, similar to uses in the upper stories in the MX and within the CX anywhere and within uh, the GX. Um, this was based on a public comment uh, to plan commission meetings ago, I believe, and I believe we discussed this briefly in the last meeting, um, concern about uh, electric vehicle charging for fleet uh, vehicle vehicles. Um, so in the principal uses section under vehicle service for fueling stations, uh, there was a sentence that said fleet vehicle fueling facilities are not allowed. That was really intended to um, avoid uh, a gas station for fleet vehicles being located in the village, um, since there's so few gas stations already. Um, but the chances of that happening are, are pretty slim. Um, so we struck that sentence just to be clear. And we also added a sentence that said that electric charging for fleet vehicles is allowed accessory to the principal use. Um, so the idea here is that if you are a business um, and you have a fleet of vehicles um, that you are parking at your business as an accessory to your business, um, so that would be a customary accessory use, um, that you would be allowed to uh, put in electric charging for all of those vehicles. Uh, so we just wanted to make that clearer. Um, in accessory uses, uh, we also added a statement to clarify um, at the end that says that any EV um, supply equipment may be located anywhere on the lot um, where there is a parking space. So essentially we're not, um, we're allowing uh, any kind of a charging station and, you know, at any parking space throughout. All right. Um, in terms of our district accessory structures, um, this was a mistake. <laughs> um, number one, uh, we had uh, inadvertently left off the maximum uh, 15 foot height and the maximum 10 percent of the lot um, that is in the R district that really was meant to apply to the R districts. Um, so that was added to all accessory structures. Um, as kind of the generally applicable regulations for accessory structures, meaning that that would be um, the sort of default max height um, and the default max coverage for all accessory structures. Um, as was pointed out um, by Commissioner um, Kylie Miller, we also needed to add in all the bubbles for outbuildings and garages across all of the R zones and the P zones. And we did that, that's what's shown under square number two. Um, and then because we created that default for accessory structures and the generally applicable regulations um, for the size and the maximum um, lot coverage, we needed to go through all of the accessory structures that have more specific regulations associated with them and make sure that that was the appropriate regulation. Um, in general, all of the other accessory structures that were listed had, had height already noted. 
but we did have to go in and add in. Um, so you'll see some additional red in the accessory structure section um, that says, you know, there is no max or the maximum building um, type regulations apply to the accessory structure as well. Um, as you can see on the right hand side, we discussed drive through facilities and fuel pump canopies and decided to create their own maximum coverage. And we took this based on um, drive through facilities and um, fuel canopy covers that exist um, within the village. And we made the drive through maximum of 50% of the building footprint and the fuel pump canopies uh, no more than 35% of the lot, so a third of the lot. Um, and the last couple of slides, uh, this procedures, uh, this is all uh, information that you already know. Um, uh, for number one, uh, that for zoning review applicability, applicability, we decided that we needed to make a clear statement that anything requiring a conditional use permit needed to be reviewed um, for zoning under the zoning review procedure. Um, for design review intent, we discussed removing the phrase and property values um, at the last meeting. And then lastly, sorry, I can't see. Um, the replacement of 50% or more of all windows from the bird friendly design section is um, just noted here as well. So all three of those are, are items that we've discussed previously. And then lastly, for the design review board, um, the attorney requested that we add um, under the duties and responsibilities, a statement that says that the design review board does not have the authority to revise or amend zoning regulations. Um, and when we went to add this in, we decided that we needed to create a duties and responsibilities section that had previously been re removed because all of the duties and responsibilities were actually just the design review process. Um, so we added that in number two um, and then decided to move the design review board, um, which you can see on the left hand side. I don't know if this is too tiny for you, but it's actually under chapter 225 building construction. Um, which is, you know, kind of an odd place uh, to establish the design review board. So what we're proposing to do is to move it up to chapter 16, along with all of the other boards and commissions. So two items there, just in terms of clarification, um, are to create the establishment, the membership, and the organization of the design review board in article, a new article eight under chapter 16 and then to add um, the duties and responsibilities, just basically that um, the design review board is responsible for evaluating design elements and that they do not have the authority to revise or amend zoning regulations. That's it. I was gonna say just one point of clarification on this one. I think you covered it as well, but so this does not currently appear in the public hearing draft, um, but it was um, suggested and recommended by the village attorney to incorporate it. So we're doing our best to show you what that incorporation would look like. Um, if agreeable, we would just look for that to be confirmed in discussion and any motion that was made. The other ones that Leslie discussed um, are already in the public hearing draft. This is the only one I believe that's not um, actually in that draft. So just take that in consideration your, during your discussion and any recommendations um, that you make. I'm going to stop sharing the screen, but I can always go back to any of these sections if if needed to to clarify where we're at. Okay, I would just procedurally, um, since it's not par part of the public hearing draft, is it too late to add this given that given the scenario that we um, support it? I'd look for confirmations of village attorney, but no, my understanding is the public hearing draft can be amended through this recommendation. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's part of the process now of discussing and potentially looking at final final edits and additions. And I, the only other thing I was going to throw in there is that that's actually not a change oh. um, to what it's what the jurisdiction of the design review board is now. It just makes it even more explicit and clear. Um, I, I, I just thought some of the existing language um, um, wasn't as clear as is as, as long as we're cleaning it up and we're re, redoing the code, we might as well make that explicitly clear. 
Okay. So at this time, I would like to ask if there's any clarification needed from the um, plan commission on any of the changes that were just reviewed and that have been discussed prior to this meeting. I do have some additional. You would think after reading it four times, there mm -hmm. wouldn't be any more, but I do have just a handful of some corrections or questions. Okay. You're ready. Um, yes, we're ready. Okay. Um, the first is on, and I'm going to give you the page numbers in our packet if you're following along. Um, we have a section on definitions. And on page 57, we talk about the, a setback. Um, the minimum horizontal distance between a lot line and the nearest wall of the principal um, building facing such lot line. So I was wondering when we're talking about the rear setback, often in some of our diagrams, it's a parking lot, you know, at the rear of the building. So I thought perhaps that definition is a little misleading as far as where that rear setback is. And are we really talking about the rear yard? So I thought perhaps Bart and Leslie could just take a second look at that definition just to make sure it's clear. Uh, Leslie, is this a standard definition from the industry or from the profession? Yes, it is. And I will also note that um, each building type has building setbacks um, and then uh, parking setbacks. Um, so we have surface parking location setbacks that are that are separately called out. OK, thank you. Um, secondly. So are you withdrawing? Does that resolve yeah, your your concern? That's kind of okay. a standard thing and if it's clear. Um, on page 69 of our packet, it, it does seem like even though this is a commercial code, we do have some elements of our residential code included. And so this is where I got a little confused. At the very top of page 69, it's a continuation of a um, um, regulations about driveways. And it mentions there is landscaping necessary to adequately screen it from the street view that does not impair the vision triangle. So I was not sure, are we talking about just commercial driveways? Are we talking about commercial and residential? Because back on um, our January 2016 plan commission meeting, Bart's predecessor um, brought to the, the plan commission a proposal to limit vegetation and structures for houses on corners, at driveways and alleys. And the plan commission was not interested in that. We never discussed it again. So then if we're talking about just the commercial code and you look about where the building you know, build two lines or build two zones. Now we're going to call those. This vision triangle seems to have a conflict with that. So I wasn't sure we're talking commercial, residential, or trying to encompass both. So I believe I'm sharing my screen. Um, the answer to that is residential. So if you look back up to the um, the section title F, we are modifying that to say that this applies to our districts only. So decks, patios, porches, and driveways in our districts. Um, and so just continuing on. Um, this particular um, requirement is specific to circular driveways, which most often happen on Lake Drive. There's not okay. a lot of lots that have them. So the vegetation requirement um, in, um, uh, is it, where, where was it? Was it in B, Barbara, or where was it? Um, it was um, or five. Four, four and five at the top of page 69. Yep, all of these regulations relate only to the R districts, and this specifically relates to circular driveways. Okay. Um, and so that would not be commercial. And the only thing that we're clarifying here is that this does not apply to commercial because the commercial, we've built our own regulations for those. Okay, just because that was something that we had dropped and then never really went back to or decided we didn't want. Okay. Um, on page 77, we list all the districts. And since we are listing all the residential districts, one, R2, R3, and so on, um, do we want to continue and list all the MX, the CX, the GX districts? You know, we've got numbers for some of those or just for, you know, because of space, just keep the, the main headings. Leslie, I'd be curious of your thoughts on that. Um, that probably might be a good point. So I'll just share the screen of what we're referring to here. 
Um, and I guess I hadn't thought of it that way, so I appreciate the attention to detail here. So in this section, um, we list all of the districts. So we list R1, R2, et cetera. And so I believe the question is whether or not we should be listing MX1, MX2, CX1, CX2, et cetera. Right. I have no issues with the addition of that. I think it does add clarity because there are multiple MX, just like there are multiple R. Leslie, do you have any objection yeah, to that? I would agree. So we'd be happy to make that modification in, in the final draft. Um, it's just kind of a general question. When we finish and the the village board approves the code, will it be in a file format? So as the village makes any updates or changes in the future that you'll be able to make those barred or, or whoever, Crystal, or will we need to keep engaged with Leslie going forward and her company? No, the village should be able to make all of her own changes. Um, and so the the code, and this is going to be discussed, you know, behind the scenes at some point, but yeah. the code is um, published through eCode, which is a company that, you know, publishes it for us. So we send these updates to them. And so should the village board or plan commission, anyone want to recommend or make changes in the future, we'll just continue to work through them. Um, we would like to maintain updates of this um, nicer formatted document, the InDesign. But once again, we can just work with a graphic designer and that we wouldn't need to engage um, Leslie specifically. Okay. Um, Leslie had introduced that new usage in our chart, entertainment, which is on one page 180 in our packet. And then there's a description of it on page 182. Um, because we had not discussed this in the working group um, and reading the description on 182, the businesses that it would relate to seem to be the most likely businesses that because of noise, because of parking, um, you know, number of people coming to attend those those that indoor entertainment might be good to keep it um, requiring a conditional use permit instead of a use by right, as the chart on page 180 shows now. Just want to confirm, Leslie, that I, can you see my screen? Yes. So I, okay, I move to what she's referring to, and I'll President McKeg if you have. So. To clarify, this was not discussed in the working group? No, we didn't really, because that's why it's in red here, because it was just added. Correct. And um, just just for reference sake, um, so we received a, in, an inquiry and an application in December regarding a, a use like this. So I brought it to Leslie's attention, and she discussed it with Kirk, um, the other um, consultant, obviously, on this project. And uh, Leslie, I'll let you give the broader description, but I think it is something that you typically have. We just it never came up. And so I was just that it was my attempt to say hey, where would where would this application fall, and um, I think we discussed and agreed that it it could fall under current categories, but it made sense to clarify that. Yes, so it, and you're. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, so just to clarify between the last plan commission and this plan commission meeting, this is when. Okay, so this correct. Is, all right, I I was pretty sure that that was the case, but okay, Leslie, I'd love to hear from you. Yes, absolutely. This is this is a new a new use category. It it likely would have so the current uses do not in your current code do not really allow these types of uses. Um, we didn't have a category in the current code to carry forward, and so we had sort of left it off and discussed it early on as being a use category that likely would not fit anywhere within the village. Um, when the uh, a, a similar use or a use that would fall within this category came forward, um, we discussed making an, a separate um, category outside of con consumer service. Um, and then we added the allowance that maybe a bowling alley, a very small, maybe two lane bowling alley or something, uh, a single cinema might be able to fit into one of the existing sites. And so we created this category. And so there's a there's a square foot limitation on this to make so we don't get a multiplex, not that I think we ever would get one correct, but that was the discussion in terms of allowing smaller scale indoor entertainment uses to potentially fill um, some of these spaces, correct? Right. And this is a standard uh, definition that's included in other um, codes? Yes. Okay. Yes, we actually discussed whether or not we should 
uh, add this to your code. Um, and because we uh, didn't think that there were places, it wasn't in your current code, and because we didn't think there were places that it could occur, we had left it out initially. Okay. So once again, the recommendation was in the MX storefront district, this would not be allowed in the front, but it would be allowed in the rear of an MX district or upper story. Um, and that, I think that's a necessary point to make within the conversation as well. But, based okay. on but required by right or, or allowed by right in the CX or the GX. In the in the proposed draft, correct. Right. So your your discussion was to make it a conditional use. Right, make it a conditional use. Um, okay, so since this is a new item, I guess I want to just be, I don't want to get lost in our pr process and I do want everybody to, I think it makes sense for everybody to go around and, and weigh in. Um, so I wanted to, if we could just hold this okay. um, and come back to it and I wanted to see if you had anything else. Just a couple more. Great. So, All right. Um, kind of in that same neighborhood on page 183. Um, we're talking about not allowing veterinarians in storefront spaces. We're grouping veterinarians with human medical and dental providers. Um, since we already have a veterinarian in practice on Capitol and Stoll, we used to have one on Wilson Drive, and who knows, another um, doctor may go in there. Um, this seems like a little different than a medical office in the way that we've discussed it in the group. And in the working group, in that sure there could there is more activity. Um, clients are going in to buy pet food, pick up medicines. Um, you know, it's a little bit more vibrant than you know going for an X-ray or you know seeing your dermatologist or whatever. So um, I'm just wondering, can we remove um, veterinarians from this restricted usage where they're not allowed in storefront? Um, buildings in the in that front there and, and where would you place them in in place of being a medical dental or office clinic you would put into which category do you have a suggestion on that or you i would maybe have it in a category all its own consumer services i mean it's kind we've got some pet grooming businesses in the village we've got a pet store you know it's kind of in that same so pet grooming and pet stores are a different category yeah. um pet grooming um is just like human hair cutting right. or beauty shop and um, uh, a pet store would be a retail establishment, correct, Leslie? So those two uses, um, once again, are split out. And if they are part of a um, clinic office and they and they op and they occupied the first twenty feet of a mixed use building, they would still be allowed because they have that more storefront use. Is that correct, Leslie? Yes. Well, I think the idea behind this was that the veterinary clinic itself would be behind a more active use if it wanted to be in an MX district or itself is allowed in the CX um, or GX districts. Yeah, I mean, because, you know, most pro probably have pets. You know, I can't see, like, taking your dog up in the elevator to the second floor, that kind of thing. It just seems like right. logically so, it would have been in the storefront before. Um, I understand, and I'm glad that you yeah. brought it up, um, especially if it hadn't been discussed in the working group. Not really. um, and so, however, procedurally, what I'd like to take, because it would be proposing a change in what's in front of us and what we've reviewed, I again, I would like to um, put a pin in that and come okay. back to it for a more um, organized discussion. Okay, almost at the end here. Um, on page 192, what do we have here? Um, prohibited home occupations. Let me just, or home occupations. Um, at the very top of that page on the left-hand column, it says no person other than members of the immediate household occupying such dwelling shall be employed in the home occupation. And, you know, so it's very possible that a, a lawyer working from home has a paralegal who does her work elsewhere so, or, you know, any other profession where they're not really working on site. So I would suggest rewording that to say non-household members cannot work out of that location or out of that dwelling, just so that, I mean, it just sounds very restrictive. I just want to remind or point out that this is outside of the commercial district, and so this was not actually reviewed or discussed. Yeah. And so um, as, as a future item, I definitely have on my list to review and update home occupations in in totality. So that I think would make sense at that point. Um, there's other there's other things that we've couched as well. I believe conditional use um, findings was one of them. So 
Um, I would just suggest that that was not updated because it's not part of Leslie's scope okay. for the commercial district. Yeah, and on that same list, that same column there, number L was no activity between 10 p.m. and 7 a.m. And we did discuss that in the working group, you know, somebody who's right. baking a wedding cake or sewing something, that that's just, you know. Yep, that's um, right. it's on a future item for the okay. plan commission to tackle. Okay, mm -hmm. that's it, thank you. Okay, and I noted both of the items for discussion to return to. Okay. Um, other clarification um, items regarding the draft that's before us this evening. Okay, I think at this point, um, I would like to ask um, Attorney Bayer to comment. I forwarded, um, I had asked about the bird friendly design because it's in um, litigation now or it's being appealed. And mm -hmm. if you'll recall um, at the previous meeting, I didn't want us to include the bird friendly design until it was out of the courts um, and returned to it. So, but it was put in because I was not in the majority um, on that. So I'm gonna reopen that tonight because I am gonna make a recommendation that we hold it until that is concluded. Um, in anticipation of that, I um, asked to consult with Attorney Bear. I forwarded the email to all of you now, but Attorney Bear is here in person to comment. Uh, thank you very much. So this came up uh, earlier today. So what I did was um, I did some digging on the circuit court case that was filed in Madison, challenging Madison's version of this. Um, and there was a decision and an order that was issued by the circuit court back in August on that. And it actually that decision upheld uh, the regulation. So um, it is now been appealed this to the Court of Appeals. Um, the briefing, the, the reply brief was just filed last week. And uh, there's going to be, or I anticipate there'll probably be oral argument on it sometime in the next two or three months. And I would not anticipate a uh, decision on that until probably at least the fall. And then my guess is if the, the, the lawsuit was brought by Associated Builders, um, of Wisconsin, and my guess is that if they lose there, they may very well uh, appeal to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. So I don't see any quick uh, resolution of this, unless my guess is um, I did a little digging to see if there was any legislation on this. I didn't see anything, but um, the, I, my guess is they're probably hedging their bets and they're probably um, discussing this issue and lobbying the state legislature to change the statute, which would you know, essentially render, render the legal decision moot. But so here's here's my, uh, you know, I, I read this afternoon, I read the opinion that was uh, authored by the circuit court in upholding the regulation. It's 16 pages long. It's pretty detailed. Um, the arguments that were advanced by the Builders Association or the Associated Builders Association um, is pretty esoteric. And and I, I, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds kind of on, you know, on analyzing all the legal arguments. But Generally, what they argued was that state law preempted this particular regu regulation, and that ultimately, it's it's a it's essentially it's a building code regulation as opposed to a zoning regulation. And the circuit court analyzed it, and it said that, um, and, and I agree with the circuit court's assessment that to support this argument, the association really conducted some pretty what I would call strained readings of the individual statutes that they rely upon, and their argument is also generally premised on evaluating individual statutes in a vacuum and not reading them collectively and saying, okay, well, what else does chapter 101 or chapter 100 of the Wisconsin statutes say? So I, I, you know, I do think that the judge's reasoning to conclude that the regulation was not preempted and was otherwise, you know, valid form-based zoning laws was sound and reasonable. Um, however, as a practical matter, I can also tell you that a couple other things are true. The decision came out of what is perceived to be, whether uh, accurate or not, or otherwise, perceived to be the most liberal jurisdiction in the state, um, even if it's upheld by the Court of Appeals, um, if the case were accepted by the Wisconsin Supreme Court, um, you know, the makeup of the court tends to um, be a little more conservative than, you know, um, so the decisions we see coming out of the circuit court level in Madison, in Dane County. So my guess, you know, is that if the association loses, they'll probably appeal to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. 
and I don't think there's any resolution of the legal side of this for probably at least a couple of years. Um, I can't, you know, and again, I, this came up this afternoon. I didn't have a chance to read all of the underlying briefs that were filed in the Court of Appeals. Um, but, I, you know, I, I'll make a couple of comments. I, I don't want to predict what way the Court of Appeals will go, although I, you know, if I, if I had to come down on one side or the other, my guess is it'll be upheld, the, the circuit court's uh, affirming of the, um, the underlying zoning would, it will, will be upheld. Um, but, you know, it, if Shorewood passes this as a practical matter with 1.5 1, 1 square miles and limited areas for the size of development that this regulation would necessarily apply to, I know we reduced the square footage, of, it would, might apply to more, but it's possible that no issue surrounding the ordinance would manifest itself before the decision comes down um, whenever that does. But if it passes, um, you know, it's possible the association might take an aggressive stance on it, but also to have standing to sue, you have to, uh, my opinion is you have to be a builder that was adversely affected by the regulation. And, um, you know, this is, I, I don't want the tail to wag the dog either. I, I don't know that, um, the chances of the municipality being sued over this in the next year and a half or two years is, might not be that high, given the fact that you have to have the right development with the right number of size, with the right number of windows to even apply, and then they would have to challenge it. So, I, you know, I, I, my recommendation would be make a decision based on the policy. Um, know that a, a circuit court in Dane County has upheld uh, Dane County's version of this. And and make a make a policy decision on which way you want to go, and uh, you know I, I let the chips fall where they may legally. All right. So another way of saying that is um, this group can move ahead with the policy. You're not recommending that we defer it. Well, yeah. I mean, so to 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 give you another example of court actions over the past year that have directly affected municipalities is. There were a number of decisions at the circuit court level that related to advice given by the Wisconsin Elections Commission, and there were uh, orders stemming from the circuit court that directly um, gave an order to the WEC to withdraw certain advice that it had previously given. We don't have anything like that here, there, so there's nothing there's 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 nothing about the lawsuit that impacts Shorewood directly. Um, there's no, uh, they haven't a asked to have a stay, you know, court, uh, uh, the, the court to impose a statewide stay on any of these moving forward pending the outcome. So any, any municipality in the state of Wisconsin can consider one of these and pass it. And there's nothing about the lawsuit that would prevent them from doing it. The only consideration, and it's a reasonable consideration to talk about, it's a reasonable consideration to evaluate is, hey, we know we know this isn't done. We know that the uh, Associated Builders of Wisconsin has already appealed to the Court of Appeals. You know, it's so it, it's a it's a fair question to ask: is what do we think is going to happen there, and would we be potentially the next target? You know, if if we pass it. So I, I you know I think that's a reasonable question to ask, but I don't you know I wouldn't recommend that um, we act out of fear. I, you know, I, I would make a, an informed policy decision. And uh, the chips will fall where they may when this lawsuit gets resolved in a year and a half or two. Thank you for that um, clarification. So I'm going to say that since this group and the working group has discussed this um, item at length um, and the clear cut recommendation from the plan commission that was pre the members that were present in the previous month um, was to move forward with it, that I can support that. And then the village um, board can can consider it differently when it comes before them um, because I would think that it's kind of outside of the plan commission's responsibility to anticipate legal consequences. It seems like that's more under the purview of the village board. Um, Commissioner Wickland, do you have anything to say? You were, I believe you were excused at the previous meeting, so. No, I've got nothing on it. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, I have a yes. question. Um, so in this Madison example. A little louder. In the Madison example, um, was this about the glass itself or decals? Um, because, and I don't know how that would play out one way or another, um, but I'm I'm seeing more and more communities u utilizing decals um, as a workaround for this, including our neighbors in Whitefish Bay. They're 
considering um, requiring the same decals in their placemaking for Silver Spring Drive. Thank you. Yeah, I I, I don't I ha I haven't been able to pull the um, all of the underlying briefs and read all the affidavits and the exhibits that were filed, but my understanding from reading the court's decision and order is that it was sort of a global challenge to a um, a zoning regulation that is very similar to the one that Shorewood is considering. And it was a challenge sort of globally to the municipality's right to even conduct any regulation in this area because they were arguing that, hey, state law doesn't allow um, local regulation in this area. It's preempted. The state follows these international building codes and et cetera, et cetera, and that preempts it. So I think it was a it was a global from the way I read it and in, in the information that was available that I could find this afternoon online through uh, CCAP uh, is that you know it was sort of that global challenge rather than you know any one particular provision contained therein. If that helps, thank you. Does that help? It it doesn't exactly answer the question as to whether they were <laughs> they were decals or not. Uh, that's but because I don't, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't yeah, I don't yeah. expect you to be an expert on that. Maybe Leslie um, might have some more okay um, information for us on that. I know that she has. I'm not I'm not sure that I understand what the question is. Um, I I the way that we wrote the visual markers section um, is is to allow a variety um, of methods of marking the glass. So they can um, use embedded fritting, they can etch the glass, or they can use film or UV coating, which would be decals. Um, oh, sorry, Bert, Bart, I didn't, I didn't include yeah, that. that is, that's, in fine. that's fine, that's <laughs> fine. Um, so, so the way that we wrote it was to be clear that there were a variety of ways the visual markers could be applied. Um, I don't believe that the Madison Code was that clear um, in terms of it, it. I think it called visual markers out, but it didn't, and it called the pattern out, but it didn't necessarily discuss the methods of application of the pattern. Um, so we are being clear to say because we had so much discussion about wanting to allow the less expensive route of applying decals to the outside of the glass, um, we we got a little bit more specific with what those visual markers could be. I don't know, um, Kate, if that. Yes, that okay. does. Thank you. OK. Thank you. I found that helpful as well. It's still probably too small to read, so I don't know. It's on page 323 of the packet if anyone wants to reference it. but. Yeah, there was a differentiation, I believe, in how this was designed. OK, well, as I said, I'm going to withdraw that concern and, and not ask the um, body to consider otherwise. Um, so going back to the items raised um, by Commissioner Kylie Miller um, on page 180, 182, um, the um, indoor entertainment um, use section, since it's presented to us um, as a an allowed use or use by right in the CX and GX um, areas. I would like to hear comment um, regarding that first, and then we can decide based on if there's enough support, um, whether or not we need to consider um, a change. Yes. Can I add a little clarification as well? So as I mentioned, this, this was in response to an application that came into me and my initial response, I recall, was that I would have considered this an event venue. And so the, the proposed code for indoor entertainment is treating it the same as an event venue. If you just want to read what the event venue says, um, an event venue is a multi-purpose venue fa facility hosting special events such as graduations, weddings, anniversaries, holiday gatherings, trade shows, corporate functions or parties, concert settings, and general get-togethers. An event venue typically includes indoor and outdoor seat and or outdoor seating in a stage or event area but not a full service kitchen. So the, the draft, as I understand Leslie's presenting, would treat it the same as that minus the GX district. But um, so it's not that this use was completely not part of one of these things. It was more so that I wanted it to be more specific so that when it came in, it was very clear how the zoning administrator would review it, how an applicant, how anyone could see it. So um, once again, I, I 
it was definitely not discussed specifically in a working group meeting. I'm not suggesting that it was, but um, in terms of me as a zoning administrator, I would have reviewed it that way and moved it forward along those lines. The request that I made to Leslie was just to make it more clear so that this is not challenged or ambiguous to a board of appeals or things of that nature. So um, I, I will let you guys debate, you know, if you want to change it or not. I have no problems with that discussion. Just wanted to give you further background on um, the the reason why it appears as a new item. It was primarily at my request because I didn't want to have um, ambigu ambiguous language kept in the code. I appreciate that um, forethought and um, and actually the change that's brought before us. I guess I'd like to hear from. Um, Leslie, I know... Sorry, Leslie also has her hand raised. Maybe, oh, maybe I, I said something I or didn't say something. I don't know. Leslie, I'd like to hear from you. No, I'm sorry. I just I, I also wanted to say that um, if if we do make it um, a conditional use permit, I'd like to hear what kinds of um, requirements would be uh, what kind of conditions uh, that you would apply. Um, what's the reasoning behind making it a conditional use and then what would you review it based upon? Thank you. Um, so for that reason, I would like to start with um, as the draft as presented, um, is there support for that? I know Barbara Kylie Miller, uh, Commissioner Kylie Miller raised some concerns, which is why we're discussing it. Um, well, we should discuss it anyway because it's new, um, but I'd like to hear from the other commissioners at this time to see if there's a reason to move forward with proposed changes. Mr. Yeah, I, su I support it as written. I, I am interested. It sounded like Barbara's concern was around noise, maybe. Um, you know, and we have that with a lot of different things in here. So that's why I. I think I'm fine with it the way it is, but I'm interested to hear what she has to say. Okay. Would you like to hear that now? That'd be great. Commissioner Kylie Miller, what are, what was your concern about leaving this as a use by right versus a conditional use permit? Um, well, to answer Leslie's question, for any conditional use permit, we have seven criteria that we evaluate an application on. And so I know in some of the other things, whether it was a uh, you know, an exercise place, spin cycle class, uh, wine bar, whatever. Um, one of the things we have to look at is whether the use being proposed interferes in any way with surrounding property or surrounding businesses or neighbors, you know, say if it's a multi, a mixed use building. And so that would be like one of the main things. And, you know, depending on how robust this activity is planned for, you know, that bring might bring more traffic into the area. So I would say noise and Traffic and parking are really the main things. Again, mm -hmm. I don't have an issue with any of the uses. It's just it's something that we should review as a conditional use. Okay. Thanks. Other um, support or concerns? Hold one. Or other commission. I think I'll go around with the tyranny of the circle just because I want to be clear <laughs> that we've talked about it. So. Commissioner Pollock. I have no concerns. I doubt that that's written. Okay. Commissioner Flynn Post. Same. Same. Um, I also, I've actually been, um, I have had <laughs> residents say that they would love to open a movie theater and show one film, Bottle Rocket by Wes <laughs> Anderson, <laughs> case in point. Um, over it, yeah, that's the only film that they want to show. I know it's a, it's a limited business plan and they haven't come forward, but just <laughs> Leslie saying it would be a winner. So as long as this would cover it, I think uh, we have residents that would love that. Um, Trustee Stokebrand, thank you for attending this evening and you raised your hand. I was just wondering, and maybe other people have done this too, would ax throwing, would that be part of this? Because I know, I mean, like dartboards seem, a lot of Wisconsin dartboards, right? But what about the ax throwing? that I've seen that be part of indoor entertainment that, you know, I guess I'm just thinking it seems different than a dartboard. And for some reason that I can't explain, I would like that to have a conditional use permit. Leslie. Oh, you're muted. No. Yep. Um, Bart would be the one who would uh, interpret indoor entertainment as Axe throwing, I would say that it probably would fall within um, that category. Um, we don't list it specifically. 
Um, but they they are fully inside, um, and I think the safety uh, issues for the interior is is sort of similar. I don't I don't know that you would treat it any differently. I, I don't think I would. And we don't have examples of like the city of Milwaukee. Does it have um, pro prohibited use around that, or it's not per you're not recommending a prohibited. You're saying that conditional use and we might Correct. I know, I know the city of Milwaukee allows it obviously because they have them I don't know under what um use category they are if they're permitted they're conditional I can definitely follow up and looking at that I, I don't imagine um there's very specific conditions based on an axe throwing versus mm -hmm. a more general category so once again the intent of this was to have a more generalized category to be able to review these things and so if you're looking at it it says establishments that provide commercial gathering places primarily indoors for participant entertainment. Um, we're not here to discriminate on whether it's billiards or, or axe throwing, I suppose. Right. Um, if there if there is a public safety issue with axe throwing, I don't know if the zoning code is the place to do that. Right. But um, so yes, to, to the short answer to the question, I would interpret it within this category. I don't know what conditions, once again, you would place on it specifically, um, but if you have ideas, I'd be happy to entertain those. OK, thank you for that comment is um, I guess I would say if anybody wants to make a recommendation um, to um, specifically name axe throwing as a conditional use, uh, this would be the time to discuss that. I'll make that motion. In Wisconsin, I've always thought with, with all the alcohol people drink here, that's an accident waiting to happen, but it does look like fun. OK, so, so make it a conditional use. Um, I think I would like you to make a motion and then it would need a second. Now we're going to, we're talking about this as a standalone use as opposed bro broken I, out from these other entertainment uses. Specific. Yeah. So procedurally, I'm wondering how to, because we're, we're recommending tonight, but I would like to, if there's a motion to change or add anything, I want it to be in the minutes as a motion. Um, and so the motion would be to make X change <laughs> in X se section, and then it would need a second. Then we would deliberate and vote. I have no issues with that. Okay. Um, so since we are on this um, discussion item, if there is, um, if there's a change to, well, we're talking about indoor entertainment. So first I'm going to say, are there any motions to change anything um, in the entertain the indoor entertainment section? Well, you know, that last line says does not include adult oriented businesses. Could you just put or axe throwing? And I mean, Commissioner, you know how to put before we get too in the weeds on axe throwing, I've yeah. thought of 12 other hazardous activities just off the top of my head. I don't know if we want to get into the weeds on thinking I ax throwing or I, I, I have a permanent men's softball injury. I mean, like there, there's like so many things here. We could go on this forever. I'd, I'd rather we, we not, you can do what you sure. want, but it, it's right. So I would welcome you to make a motion um, with any regard. If you want to try it in this section, then make the motion. If there's a second, we'll take a vote. If there's no second, then it fails. Well, so, this, so the sentiment seems to be keep the the usage chart for indoor entertainment as is. I would be more agreeable to then change the description on page 182 to include what is allowed and what is not allowed or what so is something. Tell us where of. that is and, and what it is. I'm just going to be really right specific. rather than make a more complicated chart. Right, so tell us what that, your your motion is. Um, I get confused easily, so we gotta just yeah. keep the. So we talk about typical general entertainment uses include cinemas, theaters, arcades, bowling alleys, and experience-based entertainment establishments, such as laser tag, laser tag, escape rooms, and arts and crafts workshops. Does not include adult-oriented businesses, or businesses offering experiences like axe throwing. Okay, so that's your motion yes. to change the budget. Okay, is there a second? I don't even want to put hazardous in because yeah. anything that's an open term. I'm not hearing a second. 
So we will move on. Thank you. Commissioner Wicklund. Well, if we're making, can I just make a motion to approve this as it's written? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve this as it's written. Second. Motion by Commissioner Wicklund, seconded by Commissioner Pollock. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay, motion carries 4 1. Yes. Sure. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I was just saying that just for the minutes, I just wanted to make sure that it's clear if somebody's not attending the meeting, they know specifically which thing you're voting. Sure, my motion was to approve it as written. And it says 535 25D sub 4 entertainment, comma, indoor establishments that provide commercial gathering places, primarily indoors. For participant or spectator entertainment that have no more than 20,000 square feet of total gross floor area. Typical general entertainment uses include cinemas, theaters, arcades, bowling alleys, and experience based entertainment establishments such as laser tag, escape rooms, and arts and crafts workshops. Does not include adult oriented businesses. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, motion by Com Commissioner Wickland, um, seconded by Commissioner Pollock. Um, any discussion? Need to make an uh, include in that motion that you're voting on the allowability in the chart as well as the description, or is that just that's part of it? That was the yeah. It's about number two. I mean, I also think it'd be clear for you to say as drafted um, because the presentation clearly. So your definition was there, but as drafted, it is shown as a permitted use. Um, as of right in upper stories only in the MX district or permitted use in the CX and GX1, GX2 and GX3 districts. If you're agreeable to us, including that, I, I think that is clear to me. I was thinking that in my head, Bart. So Perfect. And, and P1 and P3. And P thank you, Barbara. And P1 and P3. That is well, Barbara. Thank you. Well done. Good and I think one. Josh was thinking it too yeah. when he second. <laughs> yeah. So friendly amendment there. We're all in the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So any further discussion? All right. Um, hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay. Motion carries four one. Thank you. The next item to discuss. Um, I forget the page number, but it has one eighty three. With the veterinarians. 183. Mm -hmm. And uh, Commissioner Kylie Miller um, wanted to make the distinction um, between vet offices and remove them from that section. Right. And that they be allowed in storefront office buildings. Okay. So I'd like to open that up in to discussion. So the, I guess what I would like to do, it's easier to see if there is Let's look at how it's presented now to make it more clear as to whether the group, the body is um, interested in entertaining a change. Leslie, can I ask you to confirm that you're seeing the screen? I'm just always conscious if I'm sharing yes. or not. Okay. All right. So it is section 53525D9 medical or dental office or clinic currently includes and veterinarians license for such practice by the state. And it says that, oh, and veterinarians, okay. So yeah. it currently reads workplaces of medical practitioners, such as medical doctors, optometrists, dentists, physical therapists, chiropractors, and veterinarians licensed as for such practice by the state and where appointments are typically scheduled in advance. The subcategory includes outpatient clinics, and urgent care facilities, but excludes medical services provided in hospitals. So this refers to the um, which part of the code. So we're saying that this is. It's the usage chart again on page 180. Mm -hmm. And so they are permitted as of right in the upper stories only of the MX and the CX buildings. Um, but permitted as right on our all areas on the GX. Okay, so it's similar to um, the medical dental, right? And your and so the reality is they are allowed on the first floor 
in some sections, but not in all sections. Um, and so your argument is that you'd like to remove vet offices and have them in their own section, their own um, category. Right. Okay. So is there, um, Leslie? Uh, and just to clarify that when it says upper stories for MX1, MX2, and CX, that they're also allowed in the rear. So as Bart was saying earlier, that in the front, they could have a grooming or uh, a shop um, and the vet clinic food. being in the back, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, is there a desire, I mean, we could approach it two ways. You could make a motion to remove um, vet clinics from this section, or we can um, make a motion to approve it as drafted and presented. Commissioner Wakeland. I just have a question for Leslie. So the, you know, and maybe intense the wrong word, but the intent of this is right. So dentists, no one's doing a root canal in the window of the ground floor of a building and no one's probably neutering a dog on the ground floor of a building, right? Right. I mean, that's, okay. And, I just wanted to And just to take it a, in the another front, In the back you can though. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And to take it a little step further is it's, it's you know, because you don't want to do that in the front storefront window, um, if they needed to use that front space, they often put up blinds and block, and we want to avoid having sort of blocked storefront windows along the sidewalk as well. Just in those sections. We allow it some places. But, but again, and, and you can put, from what Bart said earlier, if it's a grooming place and they're shampooing a dog, that can be in an open window, and we're just fine with that. It's right consumer service. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's allowed. All right. Mm -hmm. That answered my question. Yes. Although I think most of the veterinary clinics I've gone to, and I think it's probably true of those in the village, you know, that front storefront area is your reception area, a waiting room, place to weigh the, the dog. Yeah. And, you know, so any cute. clinical stuff is taking back in the rear yeah. of the building. And they're usually standalone structures mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So I'd be happy to make a motion. Sure. Um, that we remove veterinary clinics or veterinarians from the uses chart to be, you know, so it's not included under medical dental clinic office, but be in a standalone row of itself and be allowed um, as a permitted as of right in an MX, CX, or GX building. Okay, is there a second? I'm not hearing a second, so motion fails. I can hear my cat I, mine from here. Yeah, they're so cute. Um, I think humans are cute too. So, <laughs> okay, so that concludes all the points of discussion, I believe, because everything else was um, resolved at the point um, of discovery, if you will. Yeah, Bart said he was going to work on the home occupation thing later. Later, yeah. exactly. So there's no need to look at that. The land Commission will work on those together. But okay. yes. Yeah, <laughs> sounds fun. So, Commissioner Wickland? So I know we were, that was discussion, Barbara had, those are good questions, but are we to the point where we can make a motion on thing? We didn't do public comment yet. Right. We are not, yeah, okay. we don't right. have to, it's not agended for public comment, but I was going to ask if there's anybody that would like to be heard on this matter. Yes, Trustee Stokebrand. I guess something that I think most residents would like to know, if take a look at this. Is there a place that we can go? Is there a place that has adopted this with 100 miles of our village so we can see Try to get an idea for what will form-based zoning look like in our community in years. Is there is there any place we can see how this zoning theory has manifested itself so people know residents will be able to decide for their own? They can call somebody who lives there. How has this worked out? To my understanding, we're one of the first ones. And if we are, what makes us, why should we be worried about that? I, I, it would be if there's a place we can go and we can talk to people who have lived in a community where they've done this form based zoning code, maybe they've done a complete form based, not a hybrid like ours, whatever. Uh, I think that would be helpful for me. I'd go there, I'd look, I'd talk to people, say, how's it going? What are you happy with? What are you not happy with? Because I think there's, you know, concerns about how this will affect our commercial activity in the. Thank you. So, uh, Leslie? 
Did you hear that question? I, I couldn't hear most of it. I think I get the gist of it. She was kind of going in and out a little bit, but within um, a hundred within a hundred miles, is there a municipality that has adopted a hybrid? Oh home? yes, absolutely. There there are many many communities um, within a hundred miles. Um, Highwood, uh, Illinois, has a form based code for their downtown. Um, Villa Park, Illinois, has a form based code for their downtown. Alloway has a form based code for their entire village. Um, and that one's near Green Bay, correct? Alloway? Near Green Bay, just, just yeah, just south of Green Bay. Um, De Pere just adopted a form based code um, very similar to Alloway's, um, which is just next to Alloway. Um, I, I mean, I could I could give you lots of places, um, and and I believe Bart called uh, several of my references um, from across Correct. the country. And yes, nationally yeah. form based codes are far from new. I mean, Leslie, I don't know um, Seaside is that in the nineteen nineties, right? So this has been around for nearly yeah. thirty years, if not longer. I, even I don't know you you know the history better than I do. Um, the city of Milwaukee does have it in redevelopment areas, so the Park East corridor. Um, does have form-based um, standards um, that have been developed and are around for the past, you know, 15 or 20 years, however long the park East has been gone. So this is by no means new nationally. I think I've shared in the past that this is somewhat n newer to us and or the region just because um, we haven't had, um, and this is just frankly my discussion, we haven't had consultants, you know, in the area that specialize in it. So um, but nationally, I go to every conference, and this is this is what is discussed in terms of of zoning um, codes. So, yes, in terms of nearby neighbors, I mean, Whitefish Bay has elements of form based written in their code rather than design guidelines, but it's not structured as I would say nicely as ours is in terms of building type, site design regulation, et cetera. So, I think um, we're progressing well beyond design guidelines and putting it in a format that's the most useful for everyone to utilize, um, and Leslie, you can you can say more if you'd like, but um, other communities definitely have this. We're my comments were that we're relatively new in the Milwaukee suburban communities to have such a robust, distinguished form based code draft in front of us. Trustee Stokran, does that give you enough to do the research that you'd like to do? If you could come back, yeah. I think everybody's nervous about like the first five years. Well, we have empty storefronts because of the restrictions. And so I guess maybe that would be something to bring to the village board meeting. Um, places where this has been knowing, but keeping in mind that every community is different and has nuances. Um, where has it been in place for five years? Because, and I'd like to know what happened to their downtown business. So you or would like staff to prepare that for you or you want to do that research on your own? That's what, what, they, what I heard. What does staff is recommend? Well, I can just I can just say in terms of form based code and uses, those are those are two separate items. I don't know if Leslie wants to comment on that, but if you're asking for like vacant uses, that's that's the more traditional Euclidean zoning where the use table um that is not the main emphasis of the form based code section. So we merged those two in in what was considered a hybrid form hybrid form hybrid form based code early on. But if you're looking at vacancies based on use regulations that would not relate to form-based standards. Form-based standards would relate to new developments and whether or not developers for some reason chose not to develop there because they were too stringent or, or et cetera. So um, I'm happy to research what I can and I can talk to you offline prior to the next board meeting to get you um, some answers on that. But just keeping in mind that there are separate items here that we're being, I think I'm being here, that I think I'm hearing form-based code in terms of development and uses in terms of the use table. So. Once again, I'm happy to um, okay. continue before the February 6th public hearing. Thank you. And I think, um, oh shoot, I had a brilliant point, but I forgot, maybe it'll come back, so um, yes. I'd just like to make a comment that um, I see a huge opportunity here for a communications plan. And this is something that had come up during the working group discussions just to, help the community understand what form-based planning is all about. So one of the ideas was to maybe show the design process as it stands and then what, you know, maybe in the in terms of visual, visuals or another format, varied formats, 
um, this is what it will look like now, because I, I feel like that's a very important um, element to demystifying what this all means. I mean, this is hundreds of pages <laughs> and I love it, but um, but I think, you know, how can we figure out a way to to communicate this more effectively, maybe? And and also just highlighting that this is a direct follow on and output of the comprehensive planning process. So this mm -hmm. is just flowing straight out of that. This is yeah. not like a new. And we did have, you know, we did thing. have a, com a communications plan that we approved with this project. Um, and so, you know, if hindsight, you want to add anything, I guess I would put it back on to because we we did approve that and we considered it and got input. Um, so point taken. Um, and also my point around the developer, you know, impact on development, we did have a focus group of developers um, that, you know, this, the draft before us is reflective of a of, of diverse array of stakeholder input um, along with, you know, professional experience. So not saying that there can't be something, but I'll, I'll remind the village board of that. Um, moving forward. So thank you to Director Griepentog for being willing to do that extra uh, research and, and bring it forward. Yeah, I was just going to remind everyone there will be a presentation at the public hearing that we can incorporate this information into. So I'm not, I'm definitely open to answering these questions so that we don't have them raised, you know, later in yeah. the game. So whether you think of them now or prior to February 6th, um, I know we also had a request for, you know, what are the, the top five biggest change or things like that. So Leslie and I over the next two weeks, we'll um, ideally be able to prepare a public hearing that presents all of this information once again um, in, a, in a succinct manner that hopefully people will understand the full process and what the code is going to be doing um, moving forward. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, Commissioner uh, Kylie Miller. An answer to, partly an answer to Leslie's question. There is that process chart with all the arrows in, in the code. So that's helpful for, you know, okay, mm -hmm. this is what you want to do. This is where you start. Mm -hmm. So maybe that, along with the new zoning map amended to show, you know, we've got all the different colors, how many heights in each zone, mm -hmm. and then the usage, the usage chart. You know, mm -hmm. those, those three things mm -hmm. are pretty, you know, sum up pretty well mm -hmm. what's in the, in all the hundred and some pages. Mm -hmm. But I did yeah. have a question about what the plan was generate the public to come to that public hearing. I mean, maybe that's under future agenda items. So to no. President McKegg's point, there was a communication plan that was adopted for this. So um, there have been village managers memos for the past two weeks. It'll be in there once again this week. Next week, this is the feature story. Um, and so we're hoping to have some of this information that we're discussing tonight and that's been requested in the past as part of that feature story to, to sell that. Um, it's being advertised on our village social media. We ask that um, plan commissioners, working group members, village board members, um, you know, promote it to people. I did send out an invitation to village trustees this week. So I think we had three additional trustees um, participate in this meeting. So we are getting the word out in our typical channels. Um, I will be doing a press release in the next week as well. Hopefully someone picks it up and drums up some interest on that. But yes, there was a communication plan drafted and we are following that. Um, I'd be happy to share that as a reminder or reference for everyone, but I do um, check off those boxes as we as we get to things. I'm also sending out um, proactively a, a mailing, um, reminding people of the public hearing if they own property that's proposed to be rezoned. The entire commercial district will once again get a mailing. They were also invited to the public um, workshop in November. Um, so we're using that same list. So they'll be getting a mailing as well as the PDDs just to make sure that people understand that this also um, does impact, um, doesn't change anything, but just so they're aware of, of what we're proposing. So yes, we are we are trying to hit our bases on this stuff. It's, this is not a new project to Leslie's um, graph. It's been going since last February. So hopefully if people wanted to be engaged, they've had plenty of opportunity to do so by now. And um, we'll just continue over the next two weeks and we look forward to your help in, in us doing so um, to get that message out for the February 6th public hearing. And the reason why we um, invited the trustees is so that, you know, with at, a, at 192 pages, if you weren't involved in the working group, you know, it's a lot to catch up on. And so we wanted to provide that leeway time to that they could come tonight um, and then submit questions so that to Bart's point that we have a public hearing presentation that is thorough um, and because we will not be able to take, you know, all those. We're not going to rewrite it by committee that night. Like that's not. Um, 
not a viable process. So um, are there any other members of the public who would like to be heard at this time? All right, I'm not seeing any hands and there's no one coming up to the mic. Um, so at this time, I would take a motion um, to recommend the ordinance amendment implementing the commercial zoning update um, as presented in our packet. Commissioner Wicklin. Yeah, I move to um, recommend. Oh. Could you also include that DERB thing? So in the packet, once again, I mentioned that that proposed change Request by the village attorney on DERB is not in the packet, so maybe ah. inclusive of that. Do I have to say say the read it? Um, no, no okay. just say inclusive of the changes requested by the attorney in relation to DERB or something of that nature. Okay, I move to recommend the changes associated with the commercial zoning update as drafted, with the DERB additions, and also with Barbara's changes to that MX section and stuff, adding those different. As owners and direct staff to prepare an ordinance amendment implementing the village's commercial zoning update by repealing and replacing chapter 535 zoning and associated changes in section 225-12 design review board chapter 319 article 1 food service subsection 326-7 minimum space use and location requirements chapter 437 Article 2, display of merchandise in outdoor areas, and subsection 455-2, refuse and collection service for village board consideration. Second. Motion by Commissioner Wicklin, seconded by Commissioner Pollock. Um, any discussion? Yes, Commissioner? Um, I looked at my calendar. 13 meetings of the working group starting with the very introductory one, and that doesn't include all of our discussions the last several months. Um, and I was very excited about this, and I and I have said to Leslie before, I think there's lots of great stuff in here. But unfortunately, as I mentioned at the last meeting, I do think we fell short in a couple areas. Some zoning changes that should have been made and weren't, and some that are being made, and I think we will regret. You know, again, things that may not come to pass for 10, 20 years, but this is what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I'm going to vote to not recommend it as it is written tonight. Noted and appreciated. Commissioner Flynn Post. Um, so I'd just like to reiterate again that this is a direct output and follow on from the comprehensive planning process. Um, and I think it does a great job of articulating and capturing many of those priorities that were identified through a village-wide um, process and, and a process that I don't think that we need to reinvent now through this um, through these amendments to the zoning code. Um, as Barbara just mentioned, it's this has been an exhaustive process with dozens of community members involved, hundreds upon hundreds of community member hours invested in this. Um, and so I would urge the village board to adopt these changes with the confidence that the issues have been thoroughly vetted by the working group and also by um, the plan commission and also the public hearings. And this is a huge opportunity for Shorewood to enact a new vision for building for our community and one that um, is following a lot of um, complaints and concerns about previous developments in, in recent years. So I think that this is um, something that is timely, and I, I would urge the board to, to make these changes. I'd also like to thank Director Friepentrog for his stellar leadership in this process, shepherding this along over the last year. And also, I'd like to thank um, Leslie for her patience with our group <laughs> and all of her great work in helping us to craft these changes. So thank you. Well said. Thank you very much. Other discussion, yes. Yeah, I know I made the motion, and I'm pr probably not going to get you to change your vote, Barbara, when we vote. No. But, I mean, again, I think through this process, there's some parts of it that I don't necessarily agree with, but I think are probably might work well for the residents of Shorewood. So I encourage you to look at it as a whole, you know, not in what is is perfect in the, in the little individual pieces. You know, I'm a detail-oriented person. That's where it all comes down to, details. But appreciate it. Anything else? Yes. 
come to the mic and give your name and address, please. Yes, my name is Bessie Derricks. And is it, would it be correct? Talk louder, please. Uh, uh, Jesse Derricks, um, is it correct? It, it looks, as far as I can tell, the, the proposal for the indoor facility restrict to the basement or second floor. So that, that proposal would it needs to be behind the first 20 feet of the storefront of MX. And so once again, you can have it on the first floor with a different, um, more active use in the front. Like a snack shop or Oh, so that merch. facility couldn't have a... No. So, um, and I'd be happy to clarify this outside of the meeting, but um, the arena itself could not be in the first 20 feet. That needs to be some sort of retail or... Um, active use um so the the basement second floor there's no limitations on where the indoor entertainment can be on the first floor the first 20 feet of that use needs to be something more um active is it the, the way it reads it seems like it needs to be a different business which needs to be a different use so there a, a business can have multiple primary uses right, so okay in in your so, case, you're proposing uh, some sort of retail. Um, right, exactly. Correct. So that yeah. would need to be located in the front. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And yes, we can talk about it more specifically um, whenever you want to make a meeting. You've alleviated the concern. Okay. <laughs> it's not axe throwing, is it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's stay focused. All right. Sorry. Getting late. Okay. All right. All right. Hearing no further discussion at this time, I'd like to take a vote and. Um, all those in favor with the motion as presented, uh, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay, motion carries 4-1. Thank you very much. And um, I agree with everything that's been shared about the number of hours put in, and I hope I find some way to thank you all for this um, labor of love. It was really impressive. Um, moving on to item seven, future agenda items. Um, we may have a pending application depending on when this code gets adopted for um, an indoor entertainment use. Um, we also at some point in the near future need to address um, our future initiatives, which if this passes could be home occupations, could be a multiple um, list of things. So I'll bring that back um, as directed by the village manager so that we can discuss that at a future meeting. Excellent. Oh, and I will extend um, an invitation to all commission members to attend the um, village board meeting and public hearing. Um, and if not in person, virtually, just in case there are any questions from the village board that only you can answer. Um, appreciated. Uh, item eight, motion to adjourn. I think about I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I'll second it. All right. Motion by Commissioner Wickland, seconded by Commissioner Pollock. Um, any objections? Seeing none, uh, we are adjourned at 823. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Leslie. We will see you in February. Thank you very thank much. You, Leslie. Thank you.